Thermometric property, right, is anything that um, is intrinsic to the material that uh, changes with temperature. So it could be, for example, a gas, right, the pressure may change, um, a volume may change. A piece of metal, okay, when in different temperature, right, the resistance value will change uh, and so on. So all these properties, right, that changes with temperature, we call them thermometric property. And you can employ the fact that there are property changes, right, with temperature to make them into a thermometer. Yeah. So, to make something to thermometer, right, you need to actually have like uh, a reference, right, what measurement of the uh, D correspond to what temperature, what value of the temperature. So to do this, right, you at least need to have two points. Okay, these points, right, we call them calibration points. So for instance, right, uh, in a thermometer, which you are familiar, you put the thermometer, right, into ice. Then right, you mark out the mercury level. Then you put it into uh, hot water, boiling water. Then you mark out ever so on the thermometer is, then you know oh okay this is the height of uh, actually it's the volume yeah if i express as a height of a zero hundred degree then you split it up so you know right that at different heights there will be a corresponding temperature so that will be how uh, it is done for all other things So once you come up with a thermometer, right, then you will want to say, oh, uh, what, what about the scale? Well, people actually came up with scale, right, at the same time they come up with thermometer because right, once you have done the calibration step, you want to put numbers into your um, measurement, yeah? So one of the most common uh, scale, right, that we see even now, right, we think that that is still the thing, which is a centigrade scale. Basically, right, they use an uh, um, ice point and a boiling point, right, to as a two calibration point. Then they decided, right, that, oh, 100 units is a uh, good scale to use because, right, it gives enough um, uh, division, okay, so as to be able to tell things fi uh, fairly apart, finally apart from each other. Uh, because if you have 100 division, right, that's pretty good. So that is actually what we call the centigrade scale. Okay, the last one, right, in this line here. Oh, sorry. And, yeah, and you can see other skills there. Yes, right, all these skills are not uh, very good because, right, they are just empirical. Empirical, right, is we got them from real life, we got them from experiment, okay? But not have a theoretical meaning behind it. Uh, it doesn't have a theoretical backing, okay, behind it. So it's purely out of experience. You just go to go, uh, go into a life just for uh, two convenient points that you use as a calibration point, and then you set up your own skill. That's about it, okay? But then we know, right, that Everything in physics, right, uh, when, when we say something has zero length, it really means, right, that it is a point. It's not just by a mere coincidence, right, zero is assigned to some um, length, okay? So we are not saying, right, that the shortest guy in a room is called zero height, zero height, and the tallest guy is called uh, uh, 100, okay? And then, you and then you divide the height difference, right, into 100 parts. Because, right, you know, the shortest guy is also not uh, zero meter, yeah? So zero, right, when it comes to length, has a meaning. Times of mass have a meaning also, yeah? So what about temperature? When you say, right, uh, the ice point is zero degrees Celsius, right, you're not actually saying that that is the lowest, the smallest that something can get. Because um, by the time people done this scaling thing, right, they already have experience with, um colder things, yeah, the liquid nitrogen, all these things, right, already exist. So they know, right, that things can get much colder than ice point. So that zero, right, has no meaning already, yeah, uh, in the absolute sense. 
So people then go on and uh, try to find out. Oh, sorry, I forgot to present this one, the uh, centigrade scale. So people then go on, right, and try to find, could we um, have temperature, right, kind of uh, temperature describing the same kind of how zero uh, length, zero kg had in their respective uh, properties. And it turns out, right, that when they were trying to do this experiment, measuring how pressure in a gas, right, changes with her, they see that um, below their conventional zero degree centigrade, which is ice point, they actually uh, believe right that all these lines you see, uh, all these lines right, shows that as pressure increase, as temperature increase, pressure increase. But you see, even at zero degrees Celsius, right, there is a non-zero uh, pressure. And if they extrapolate it uh, backwards, right, they realize right that all these uh, p against t graph right seems to coincide at a certain point. It seems to suggest right that there is something happening there. Uh, whereby right pressure will fall to zero together with that particular temperature, and according to their understanding of uh, pressure by then right they realize that the pressure is caused by uh, molecules pumping into the container all these things right so and temperature right is uh, associated with the energy of the molecule so could it mean right that uh, at some point the temperature could really be uh, zero such that right. Molecularly, the particles right are all uh, not doing anything anymore. They are not jiggling anymore. They are like almost at rest. Yeah, and perhaps right that is what it meant to be zero temperature. And of course, right uh, that is what we have. So that is the idea of the absolute scale. The absolute scale right comes from a, a, a fundamental understanding that right zero must have a meaning one and it corresponds to the state right whereby things stop having activity they stop moving at the molecular level oh. so but by then right people are really very used to the uh, 100 uh, centigrade scale right because it was that uh, it was around for some years so when people realize right that oh actually that one is not fundamental we need to strip that okay we need to come up with a new scale that can assign zero, that we want to assign the zero right to that particular uh, temperature. There's some temperature out there of, uh, whereby everything stopped moving. So we want to assign zero to that temperature. But we also don't want to cause too much inconvenience to other people because they're already used to um, high point being zero and thin point being 100 and in between got other division. So what was, uh, they come up with this Kelvin scale such that, right, they made the divisions between ice and steam point still 100 grade, okay, still 100 division. So in relation to what people are used to, there's not much difference, okay. But right, um, they want to preserve the zero value for the absolute zero. So they figure out, right, that in terms of this division, uh, this centigrade division, right, that, that zero, absolute zero, right, is actually 203.15 division away from ice point. Okay, therefore, right, they call it zero and call ice point 273.15. So that's how, right, this thing evolved. Of course, right, they could uh, hack care, the, the person who come up with the absolute scale could hack care and say, uh, I don't want to use, the, follow the mainstream one, I just, uh, come up with something radical, I can just call ice point my new 100, okay? Then absolute zero to ice point is something, okay, uh, zero to 100. Or they can come up with yet another point. Then right, it comes to the uh, selection of what point do we calibrate? Because right, ice point is by itself, right, it's actually not the best. There is better out there. So, Turns out, right, that there is a more stable point that is very reproducible uh, compared to ice point. You know, ice point, right, is a very volatile one. Although we feel that ice is, oh, ice point is like this, right? That is because we are living in uh, like a sea level. We are not living in a mountain like Everest top, right? Whereby atmosphere is different. 
when you go to the top of Mount Everest, you realize ice point and steam point changes because right, all these properties right depend on the so uh is there some point right that is very uh, stable and actually right that that's only one of that point. Uh if you've got that point, you know you are at that point. Okay, is that something like that? Uh, it turns out that there is, which is a triple point of water. Uh, triple point, right, is the is the one and only point, right, uh, if you see along the pressure and temperature axis, whereby ice, water, and water vapor, right, coexist in equilibrium, okay? How to understand this, uh, it's not easy, okay? And, and I will just quickly mention, if you can understand, good for you. If you cannot understand, right, forget it, okay? So let us um, bring our attention to just some random point on this graph. Uh, let's say we are on this blue line, okay? On this blue line here. So if you're on this blue line here, right, that you'll see that um, you could have the quick exist in equilibrium, right, with vapor. So as this particular uh, pressure and temperature, pressure and temperature, right, the equilibrium, right, could be um, achieved, okay, between the liquid and the vapor. But if you are somewhere here, right, you'll be exclusively vapor, okay? If you have liquid, then eventually you'll turn into vapor or enrich equilibrium uh, in purely vapor state. If you have somewhere here, it will be purely uh, uh, liquid, okay? Yeah, if you are purely here, then you'll be solid. And like, like I say, right, if there is still is some water and the solid, right, eventually, okay, you will turn into solid, okay? But right, there will be one point, right, whereby the composition of the system, maybe you have some ice, some water, and some uh, water vapor locked up in a box. And they wouldn't, uh, the composition wouldn't change. It means still, that would be the triple point. So this point, right, is very, very stable. And hence, right, people actually chose it for the calibration of your dynamic scale. So thermodynamic scale, right, um, I didn't include it here. You can see it in your notes or any book, okay? One Kelvin, right? It's actually one over two seven three point one six times right temperature at triple point minus temperature uh zero temperature. So we are saying right that between temperature we are cutting the entire range right into two seven three point one six part exactly. Okay. So we actually didn't use ice. We didn't use steam as well. We use triple point to establish how large is one Kelvin. Then, right, people will feel, um, but this number, right, not very practical, you know. Uh, you give us a 270 something, right? Or uh, now I have to call my eyes 273.15. Or not practical at all. Last time life was easy. So, first, you see, water is the most uh, commonly used substance, right? So, we want to have an easy number. So people then right came out with this Celsius scale. Celsius scale right is just translation of this translation of the entire scale. Yeah. Celsius right you see the ice point is zero and the steam point is hundred, but right it is not a centigrade scale. It happens to behave in this way right the size of the division and where you park the uh, uh, zero. Uh, it's similar to centigrade, but the logic behind it, right, is different. It came from thermodynamic scale, Kelvin scale, shifted by a, a fixed amount. So far, any questions? Is this making you confused? No. Wait, uh Sorry, Mr. Correct. Can you re-explain what's the difference between um the centigrade scale and the Celsius scale? Oh. Centigrade scale, right, was derived right before people know that there is something which is like the absolute zero. So they purely right say that uh 
come out with two calibration points uh, for convenience, right? Everyone at home got uh, ice and can boil water, right? So then let's just use that, huh? uh, and we establish that as the order. So someone in France, someone in Singapore, elsewhere, and that was like 200 plus years ago. So they will say, right, that zero, steam point is 100, and we chop it up into 100 parts, okay? Um, is there any meaning behind the zero? No meaning. Is there any uh, logic behind this thing? Uh, yeah, nah, that, that is, okay. It's a usefulness logic. It's a out of practicality, right? You come, you come out with this. But is this really, right, grounded in some uh, universal truth, okay? That tells you something about the nature of things. Uh, no. Centigrade is just a empirical one. Oh. Which is right, like uh, you could go into your uh, kitchen, huh? look for two things that have different, I mean, look for the same thing, uh, that has two distinct points, right? And then you can call them your upper uh, calibration point, lower calibration point. You can chop up the entire range in as many parts as you want. And that will be your own scale, okay? Yeah. So I can have a crack scale, okay, which is uh, like a freezing point of oil to the boiling point of oil, something like that also can. But that is uh, not grounded in physics. Whereas thermodynamic scale, right, is grounded in physics. The value zero really means something, okay? Um, and that is a Kelvin scale, la, or the zero degree Celsius, uh, zero, sorry, zero Kelvin really means, right, nothing is happening at the molecular level. Every atom also stops moving. Then Celsius scale, which looks like a centigrade scale, right, is simply a translation of the Kelvin scale. Oh, from the to the outsider, right, you uh, you see that there's no difference uh, from the old centigrade scale, and that's exactly the point because right, they create this Celsius scale, right, it's our convenience one. It's just I don't want to right. A lot of people call it you, right? Say, oh, wow, we use this centigrade scale for so long already. Oh, we, we, as a layman, right, I don't care whether it's an uh, absolute zero or not. You may ask, use this on 270 something, right? Oh, so it's uh, something right to accommodate uh, the original norm, which is the uh, centigrade scale. So people come out with this Celsius scale. Okay, but Celsius scale is grounded in. Uh, uh, physics okay because it is a thermodynamic scale it's just a translated version and since it's a translation right one division on Kelvin scale and one division on Celsius right it's the same it's just and all the number right moved by a certain amount Uh, before we go on, let's watch the video. I hope you can play here. Oops, what happened? Can you hear the sound? No. Okay, I'll skip this video then. Okay, uh, you, I will send you the link later on. You can go and watch it. Basically, right, anyway, this is uh, Sir Richard Feynman. He's uh, uh, arguably, right, the best physics teacher uh, of the country. He's not just a physics teacher like me, okay, um, who teach physics right, out of, uh, like, of like no choice or something. Okay? He's a world-renowned physicist. Yeah? He's involved in the Manhattan Project, the one that builds the atomic bond for uh, World War II. Yeah? Anyway, what he's saying here right, is that uh, at the bottommost level of things, which is at the atomic level, what are atoms are right, all doing? All right, they, they are quite mindless and brainless ones. Huh? Uh, Atoms are just right, jiggling objects, okay? Uh, whole day they are just jiggling, moving around randomly, okay? Uh, they could be jiggling 
on the spot. They could be juggling while uh, like going around, going around each other, going over each other, going under each other like a liquid state, or they could be juggling at the same time like they are dashing across a, a football field. Okay, so you can think about the state of metals, right? Like um, M A T T E R, like people uh trapped in a uh, LT, right? Everyone's sitting in a actual theater, fixed in a seat that's a like, solid state. Oh, but yeah, they're still digiting. You know? They are picking out their handphone, they are uh, digging their nose, okay? They are uh, shaking their legs, okay? Or people uh, who are in a MRT, okay? They are like moving around within the MRT. Uh, maybe not a good idea. A like, fish market, okay? Uh, Where market? People are walking around, buying things, it's very crowded. Or it could be a soccer player playing in a soccer field. And hence, right, whatever that we measure uh, about the system of uh, all these jigging particles, right, must be related to how the particles jigger, okay? Uh, they are individual motion, but of course, it's a huge number of them. So the way we go about studying them, right, is to uh, do some statistics, okay, and uh, come up with mean okay so that we know uh on average right how strongly are they jiggling and that will relate right to the macroscopic uh, physical quantity of the for example pressure for example temperature okay we'll elaborate more later on yeah so when we are talking about uh temperature right uh, uh like we, we know that some some objects have high temperature, some have low temperature, like a cup of coffee relative to our hand, right? High temperature. But then, right, uh, we, when we touch it, we know that, oh, heat is flowing, okay, from the high temperature object to the low temperature object. Always happening, right, at a lower level from this chipling uh, perspective. Is that, right, at the interface, the jiggling, right, of the high temperature system is more vigorous, okay, the atoms there on average, right, have more uh, uh, kinetic energy associated with their jiggling. So when it make contact with another object, the surface molecules, right, uh, will pass some jiggling Ke to the uh, surface molecules of the colder object, thereby, right, transferring uh, energy, okay. We can call this thermal energy, you can call this internal energy. And the flow of this uh, thermal energy, right, is called heat. Yeah. So that is what we need to know, right, this level. And as long as, right, on one side, the average molecule, uh, the, the average Ke of the molecules, right, is higher than the average Ke of the molecule on the other side, they will continue, right, to, to uh, spread their energy over, okay, uh, to pass it on. Until, right, there is a... Um, Equilibrium or uh, and the equilibrium right simply means right on average both sides right their Ke is about the same. So there will be no net transfer. Okay. Uh individual molecules may still accidentally transfer. Or I, 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 I may be not so energetic really, right? But when I knock into someone due to the nature of our motion, right, I could still transfer some energy over. But when you sum up over many of them, right, there's no net transfer anymore. So that's what we understand as equilibrium. Yeah. So thermal equilibrium right, simply means uh, um, two objects, their temperature comes to the same level. Okay. Temperature is the microscopic measure right, of uh, what is happening at the microscopic level. They are jiggling. Yeah. So temperature the same, the degree of jiggling is the same. Thus, right, when they come in contact, they won't tend to pass energy to each other anymore. This is quite important because right, it will actually uh, be the foundation uh, of first law of uh, uh, all the other things uh, that we are going to do later on. Obviously, when you understand this, right, then you can appreciate uh, all the other phenomena right, a bit better. Okay. Let, let's go through right uh, the next section which is uh, ideal gas 
Hang on us. There are some random objects here. Let me just clean it up. Okay, good. I do guess, right, you have learned it somewhat in chemistry. Um, but here, right, there, there are small things that uh, you need to know. So the obvious one, right, basic I do guess equation, uh, no need to say too much, PV equals NRP. Then, right, this is where it comes, it becomes interesting. Because we have a new I do guess equation. PV equals to NRP, right, the chemistry version, uses the number of mole, right, to describe the number of particles in a particular gas system, okay? And maybe I should make a, a remark here, right, to talk about what is meant by a system. System, right, is simply, right, a, a, a collection, okay? Of things, right, you uh, want to study, okay? And because right, you want to uh, something like right, it's a good idea that you isolate them uh, so that um, they don't get contaminated by other things. Uh, you can be quite sure right, that uh, things are still there uh, when you study them later on. So characteristic right, of systems is isolated. Yeah? So when we talk about a gas system, right, it simply means a box, okay? uh, a container, a tank of the gas. Uh, there could be some piston attached to it so that you can change its volume, but uh, the gas can't escape. Yeah? So we used to use the number of moles to describe the number of substances in a gas system. But now right, we uh, want to also uh, ask, right, could we go down to um, the molecular level? That means right, we want to actually count the number of particles. So we do some manipulation. How do you get the number of particles right, from um, the number of moles uh, simply right you times the Avogadro number yeah times the Avogadro number give you the number of particles so this turns into n but then you can't just sum it out of uh, thin air so you, you want to sum it you need to divide by it so we group right the r okay molar gas constant right with uh, n a as well so this right turns into a new constant or the Boltzmann constant. Essentially, right, you can see the equation that map below is the 8.31 divided by uh, Avogadro constant. Yeah. So this version of the equation, right, uh, we use it when we want to deal with uh, individual molecules. Yeah. Uh, or, or rather, right, we want to deal with individual molecules and to study them and to know their behavior. And then we want to see right, how the collection of their individual behavior right, sums up in a big way, in a macroscopic way, okay, in terms of PV. Right, if you know thing about one model, by right, uh, capital N, then you know, oh, what does that mean in the macroscopic world? And how you can relate to other things. Earlier, right, someone also asked me um, what is meant by state property in the WhatsApp group. So state properties, right, are, what, what is meant by state? A state, right, is a uh, current uh, situation that you are in, yeah? Current situation you are in, right, uh, has certain properties. Yeah? So you, you can describe them. So these are called state properties. And state properties are used to describe, right, the state of the macroscopic system. While every molecule could be doing different things, right? But overall, they sum up, right, to uh, give rise to a certain pressure, a certain volume, a certain temperature. So these are what we use to describe the whole system. Yeah. At this point, any question that you want to clarify? No? Okay, let's go on, right, um, with, I do guess, assumption. 
this one is actually not you don't need to know it uh, so well per se. I think right the only thing that you need to uh, be quite clear here right especially for those who don't take chemistry so you you may not have this exposure but there's one very important one right that has bearing on physics which is right in a, there's no intermolecular forces of attraction i will tell you the conclusion and implication of this statement first later on we'll explore it more this means right there will be no microscopic potential energy okay next right let's um try to describe right the, some uh, average properties right of the entire gas system okay for the gas right what are they doing for the molecules what are they doing they are just dashing around or in a gaseous state they're just dashing around in the football field all that they are doing is uh, moving around you could characterize them by of course you can uh, characterize them by their mass every molecule has a certain mass if it's just a homogeneous gas system right uh, inside it's all uh, helium okay and they all have the same mass but one thing that is very very different right is they bound to have all uh, because within a mo molecule uh, within a gas system right they are always colliding with each other transferring ke to each other at the same uh, all the time so their speed keep on changing yeah and different molecule have different speed yeah so how do we right go about describing uh, their average behavior or in this case we want to describe their average speed we don't want to just use a quantity which is like average of the speed yeah um why so because right the 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 the, <laughs> the velocity right could be uh um could be a negative value right depending on where you take the convention of the direction oh that's number one so if you were to do a sum of velocity right or average of velocity for large enough gas system right the average velocity is likely to be zero because for everyone that's going for every molecule going to the left with a particular speed there is slightly one that's going to the right with a particular speed like there's no bias there so average velocity right will likely become zero then why not average speed um there is a reason why we don't do average speed because right the average of the uh square is actually right more meaningful okay and you'll see that in a while so we will actually run sum up every one every molecule have uh, the square of the average trait just we will try to sum up the square of their speed and then take average so in other words right you take v1 v2 v3 for the square divided by n n molecules and then after this right then you square it or you you will think that this process right is like uh pretty silly why do we go and square it take average and then after that then we uh square root it it's because right the square is actually more important or rather right that average of square is more important uh why so because i'll just tell you this first this k is equal to half mv square right of let's say for molecule one is half mv one square so if you want to know what is the average ke right of all the molecules since the mass is the same so this is actually equals to right half m c square so this is what we call the mean square So mean square tell us KE. So it's very, very good, very, very important. Once we know KE right and describe oh, yeah, the degree of jiggling already, and that is uh, marvelous. And energy we know, right? A very uh, useful quantity to describe system. Oh, and if there is any situation whereby you need to know what is the average speed, right? And you go and square mean square, hence 
root mean square. Okay, here right, you actually don't have to lose too much sleep over this. Uh, this is a very new thing to do. You'll come across this right, uh, one other occasion, root mean square in alternating current. Don't lose sleep, just know what it means roughly, okay? And uh, know what is its significance, that's all. If you see all the square root, or all these things, one, two, three, four, until end, you hate it, right? Uh, don't think too much. Okay, right, let's uh, consider what is the uh, average Ke per molecule. Here we just tell you the conclusion. We wouldn't explain to you uh, why this is as such. Average Ke per molecule, right, uh, it is equals to three over two Kt. Yeah, as you remember, this is a Boltzmann constant. Or and very coincidentally, right, uh, the Boltzmann constant also appear here. Yeah. So this is the Ke of one molecule, average Ke. In your gas system, right, you will have uh, n molecules. So you need to times n, right, if you want to find what the total Ke, uh, and there you have it. So total Ke is equal to three over two n kT. Then you see, right, um, n kT is very familiar. We see it, PV equals to n kT. Thus, right, if the Ke of uh, entire gas system is three over two n kT, it is also equal to three over two nRT. Yeah, or three over TV. Yeah. So now, right, we have successfully right relate uh, the Ke of average Ke of a molecule, right, all the way up to the microscopic quantity, which is uh, P, V, and T. Okay. Any questions at this point? Oh, I forgot to mention the last line here outside the box. You see, um, internal energy of a system, right? This is an important idea. Okay. Internal energy of a system, right? So the sum of the microscopic Ke and the sum of the microscopic uh, PE. What is meant by microscopic and macroscopic? Okay. Micro versus macro, right? If you take a cup of water uh, and, sorry, if you take a cup of water, uh, hot coffee, right, on ground level and on a plane, okay, you see, at ground level, sitting at home, right, drinking a cup of coffee, that cup of coffee, right, will have the same internal energy as the one that's on the airplane, yeah, uh, because the microscopic Ke and Pe are all the same. You are actually adding up, right, the Ke of every molecule inside the cup of coffee. And if these two cup of coffee are identical, right, uh, the internal energy is the same. But, right, the cup of coffee that's uh, in the airplane is flying or with the airplane has a Ke, macroscopic Ke. It is also, right, high up in the sky, it has macroscopic uh, GPE or the microscopic Pe which is a GPE. So you see, um, these two cups of coffee, right, on ground level and up in the air, right, have different macroscopic energy, but have similar microscopic energy. Yeah. So that is what, how we uh, distinguish, right, the idea of micro and macro. Microscopic energy, right, belongs to the molecule. Okay, this molecule got how much Ke, uh, for how much, uh, PE. For ideal gas, so, so this is for all systems, okay, it's valid. Of a cup of coffee, a roast chicken uh, in the oven, okay, all valid. But right, if you consider in the context of ideal gas, 
since we say ideal gas has no PE, then right, the internal energy of ideal gas, right, will simply be just a KE. So it will be just this amount. So this is for ideal gas. Any question about this? Or just a quick repeat, internal energy is summing up all the KE and TE of all the molecules. Uh, for ideal gas, if they have no intermolecular forces of attraction, so there exists no potential energy which arises from attraction or repulsion. Okay, you see, any system right that uh, attracts or repels right will have potential energy one, but for um. The gas molecules because they don't attract each other at all, so there's no potential energy. So that is the logic behind things. So internal energy is just a KE, which is just equals to three over two mkT or three over T. Okay. So this formula you need to know uh, at the back of your head. Any time right, the internal energy increase, you will know right the temperature must increase. If you never uh, allow more molecules to get in. Uh, Okay. Conversely, when temperature increase, means right the internal energy must have increased as well. Oh, because the uh, n is usually a uh, constant when we are talking about isolated system. Okay. Um, this portion here, right, in grey, uh, it's not easy to understand, okay? I don't want to skip this. Uh, I think that uh, only those of you, right, who feel uh, not challenged enough, uh, you can go and read this up. And if you have problem, right, understanding it, you can ask me. But I don't want to confuse, right, like people who are, are still uh, with this kind of details. Basically, right, the conclusion is this. Conclusion you need to know. How you get to it, right, uh, not so straightforward. Conclusion is, pressure is related to the density and the speed. So, if you have a gas system, right, you manage to compress it, okay, then the density of this system will get higher, man, because you are uh, more mass, within a smaller volume, then pressure will increase. And if the molecules, right, in the process of getting compressed, uh, they may have gained speed. If that is so, then uh, you also contribute to the pressure increasing. Yeah. So that is the logic behind uh, this equation. The higher the average speed, the higher the pressure. The higher the density, the higher the pressure. Oh. Density is like the number of uh, molecules, right? And if you understand pressure as a uh, force divided by area, the more molecules per unit volume you have, right, within a particular system, right, the more frequently they collide. The more frequently they collide, the more, uh, the greater the force, right, they will exert on the wall, hence the larger the pressure. Okay. I'll take a pause here. Any question? All these all these things, right? That I say so far, right? We'll keep on building up, uh, Okay. So, uh, pay close attention. Okay. Next. Now we understood what is meant by the in of a system, right? We want to ask this question. How could we increase the internal energy hence? Okay. The short answer is right. There are two ways. First way, you can heat it up. That means, right, you, you see, just now we understood what is meant by heat. Heat, right, is to bring uh, um, object, right, uh, that 
on average have higher Ke or the molecules that have higher Ke bring that object in contact with your system, then right the molecules will keep on transferring uh, Ke to collision or they will keep on jiggling and hit the other guy, hit the other guy and transfer energy across. So your system right now will acquire uh, energy from outside. So their average uh, Ke right will increase. Hence, their internal energy will increase. So that's how you can uh, increase internal energy through heating. Now, so heating right, is taking other people's internal energy to become your internal energy. It's a transfer of internal energy from other systems into your system. That is the meaning of heating. Yeah. You see, this heat thing, right, we say a few times already, but each time that we say it, right, we add more meaning, uh, more, uh, we, we bring it deeper, okay? Now, the second way, right, that you can increase the internal energy, right, uh, is by doing work on it. How does work increase internal energy will elaborate, okay? But let's just understand, right, work in a superficial mechanical way. So how do we quantify work? You see, when you have a system, right, and um, the pressure is, say, uh, P, you have to press the piston inward or to compress it, right, and you press it by a small distance, let's say, uh, delta X. So what would be the work that you have exerted or you have done on this system? Uh, work is always, right, force times distance move in direction of force. That's right, your uh, distance move in direction of force is a uh, small delta. The force is, but you don't have F uh, yet, so you need to break F down into uh, pressure some area. Okay, then right, uh, you see that area times the air right, gives you a small change in the volume. Okay, so if right, you, you move it by a small change in volume, right, this is. Uh, a small change in volume delta V is this amount here. And this is your delta W, right? Equals to uh, T delta V. Then what is the total work? Or total work, right, you have to integrate it. Uh, so when you integrate it, right? Graphically, it simply means, right, you're trying to find what is the area under the uh, graph for PV diagram. Sorry, uh, here should be a C, not a delta. So, area under PV graph. And this is why, right, PV graph is the most useful one of, and why we keep on studying it, because through the PV graph, you can get this information. And you see, right, uh, if you understood what I say correctly thus far, right, that, uh, work done is equal to area under the uh, PV graph, then if right, volume never change, there will never be work. I repeat, I repeat myself, uh, no change in volume. Then right, W equals zero, okay? So this is a very, Inclusion. You must remember this. Yeah. Conclusion, right? That uh, we can draw, right? It all. What about um, positive and negative work? What do they mean in this context? You see, who is applying this force? Uh, this is an external agent, right? Or external agent means you, lah. Okay, you use your uh, muscle, right, or compress the piston. So relative to the force that you are exerting. If right, the distance move is uh, forward, that means right, this is a compression. By whatever that we said past far, right, the uh, work done is forced on distance move in direction of force, right? If it's a compression, then it means right, that the work done is positive. Vice versa, if it's an extension, work done will be negative. Okay. So 
any process right that has area under the graph uh, non-zero work that's the meaning and compression and expansion tells you the sign of the work what's next i'm so confused already too much diagram ah okay that study right work in greater detail we want to ask ourselves, right, uh, what really happened to the gas when we compress it, like uh, at a molecular level, yeah. So that's where, right, we bring in kinetic theory to explain, okay. So what's the link to the kinetic uh, theory? Well, let's study, right, this particular uh, series of systems, okay, a series of collisions. These are all collisions. So what is happening here, right, is we have um, a small mass colliding with a very, very huge mass, okay? This mass is so huge, right, that you can, uh, don't need to calculate, you will know, right, the conclusion, right, is uh, the following. Suppose, right, the huge mass is not moving, okay, uh, before the collision. So if you go and knock into a wall, right, you'll fly back. Oh, that's basically it. You can run into a building, you'll fly backwards. A building will move. Yeah. So that's what uh, happened to a uh, the particle. But of course, right, when you knock into a building, right, the collision is not elastic. For a molecule, right, uh, that undergoes an elastic collision, right, when you knock into a very massive sky, you will be elastic and you will come back with the exact same velocity, at the exact same speed, but opposite direction. Yeah. But then, right, what if you uh, run into a uh, big fat guy that, that is coming towards you? Oh, so imagine, right, that uh, it's, uh, I, I don't want to use uh, car accident or uh, example, just I have phobia also. Like, yeah, imagine the walking building, uh, or the building walk towards you and you still run towards the building, or you fly back, right, with a greater speed than before. Uh, vice versa, if the building is like retreating and you're running towards it, right, you collide you know, after the collision, you apply back but with a smaller speed. This is also the same as compared to say if you have a tennis ball, then you have a racket. If you swing the racket right actively towards the tennis ball, then this one right will come in with a speed V1. Go back with a speed V2. Okay. So what I'm trying to get at right through all these examples is to tell you right what will happen. Sorry, I'll give you a minute. Okay. So all this right is trying to drive at uh, one conclusion, which is right. What will happen to the molecules right uh, in the event right that you are moving the piston? Okay, and there's two ways you can move the piston. One is you compress it so you are moving the piston towards the oncoming molecule. One way is you uh, pull the piston backwards. Yeah. So one corresponds to compression, one corresponds to expansion. When you push the piston towards, uh, when you're compressing, right, which is the second case, the molecules, right, will come in with a certain speed um, and collide and bounce off with a larger speed, okay? Uh, whereas, right, if you have an expansion, the opposite will happen. Task, right, for the, let's consider a case of expansion, yeah? So after collision, right, oh, the, the speed becomes uh, larger. So this means, right, your uh, KE, right, oh, average KE will increase. Yeah. And the speed become larger, right, you also mean, right, that the change in the momentum uh, is also larger per collision. 
this is compared to if you don't move the uh, the, the piston or you are moving the piston backwards. Piston that is moving towards the gas right will uh, cause the average delta P, okay, the average change in momentum in every collision to be larger. Okay. Hence, right, the total force by gas on piston. I miss our detail. This is one point. Uh, let me erase it. The so every change in momentum per collision uh, is larger. Then you have more frequent collision as well because right now they have a uh, larger speed and yet try right, smaller room to maneuver so more frequent collision so with these two combined together right you will have a larger i guess on piston and this means right larger pressure and this uh, the top line I forgot to make a conclusion uh, larger temperature so compressing a gas right will cause the temperature to uh, increase okay at the same time right pressure also increase especially so if right, this is done very very fast such as the gas, right, don't have enough time to uh, lose heat to the surrounding. Or if, right, the gas is insulated thermally, so it cannot lose heat to the surrounding. Yeah. So that's how we understand what happens at the microscopic level uh, to the gas and what all these changes at the microscopic level in terms of uh, affect the macroscopic quantity. So Thus far, right, we have already made many, many connections. You see, we keep on going from micro to macro, macro to micro. So this is a, a very important way of thinking, right, in this topic. Yeah. Any questions? So just now, right, we uh, talk about how you can increase the internal energy of a system, right? And we say there are two ways. One way is to heat it. One way is to do work on it. Okay. And we've seen how, right, doing work will actually increase the uh, internal energy of a gas. Okay because you cause them to have larger average KD and hence temperature. So uh, is there a way right to sum up these uh, effects? Okay, so that is where right, the first law of thermodynamics come in. First law of thermodynamics right, is actually a, a conservation of energy statement. Okay, applied to uh, thermal physics. So what it's saying is that if right, I supply with a certain amount of heat and I do a certain amount of work on it, then the internal energy will change by this amount. Okay. So note right that this is increase in internal energy. Yeah. I, I let my exam mentality right. Uh, me. This is a change in internal energy. 
But right, in exam, you must write to increase in. Okay, uh, I'll elaborate that out in a while. So you see, we are saying right that the change in internal energy right is equal to heat plus work. Yeah, and it is the increase in the change. It is not the internal energy itself, because internal energy it could have a certain value. Okay, if you don't do anything to it, right, you stay at the same value. So. Now that you apply uh, apply a certain amount of heat and you do a certain amount of work, task right, these two quantities add up, gives you the increase in internal energy, not the internal energy value itself. Oh, this one must be here. Oh, because every time right, when we see students, when they are solving problem, right, they, uh, they need to find internal energy, they have no clue. So uh, they only uh, remember this formula. So they try, try their luck and try to uh, put something inside but cannot because right, it's not meant for you to find internal energy it's meant to find the change got it let me make the note of uh, what you need to stay in exam uh, what is exam looking for this is uh, uh, one of the favorite uh, structured paper right uh, First question or define or state what is or state what is not thermodynamic. So in exam, right, you must always write this. Oh, the increase in kernel energy is the sum of heat supplied to each. And work done on it. Yeah. Why must we say that it's an increase? Because it uh it is because the subsequent two terms right are saying that we are heat and we are doing work on it. So right, the internal energy would have increased. Or because right of the way of saying the two other terms, so we know right that this internal energy is not just a change but an increase. But this is like quite mean chiang la oh. uh, if you feel that this doesn't uh, persuade you enough, uh, fair enough, because I also feel that this is quite mean chiang. But this is exactly what SM wants. If you can write a change in internal energy instead, right, you'll get penalized. Oh. This C level rules are not a Singapore rule. Finally, right, let's look at the thermodynamic processes. To study a thermodynamic process, right, we will always use a, a TV diagram, okay? TV diagram, right, is useful, folks. I, I can even erase my picture. Let me undo it. Sorry, I appear when Luke uh, using this app, right? Because uh, it's my first time using it. And I can't undo it. Never mind. Okay. Is it of all the uh, state properties, right? You have P and V and T, right? On a graph, right, you can always choose two variables and plot, okay? Why do we use PV? Um, I think right, the most important reason is because PV diagram right, allow us to see work. Okay, the area on P against P graph gives us work. That is why right, fundamentally this is very useful. And why, is, uh, why does work right, make that graph useful? Because work is related to energy. Whenever you're studying a system, uh, you want to study the change in energy. So PV is the most useful version. Yeah. Then you may ask, right, when we look at PV, then we uh, miss out temperature. Temperature also very useful, right? Uh, then if we don't have temperature, then we can't uh, make sense of things. Fair enough. So we go to see temperature in the PV diagram. So this is true, right? Something we call isotherm. You know, PV equals to NRT. 
if you rewrite this equation right uh and you make p a y okay you move v onto the other side right you'll see that uh p is actually equals constant divided by v so this is like a y equals to one over x plus yeah now you see why it's contained inside the uh, k. Why is it contained inside uh, this constant here? This constant right, is temperature. Oh, and R and N, uh, but then they are like uh, real constant. Temperature may not be constant. And that temperature variable right, is captured inside this constant. But for a particular temperature, right, there is a particular P against B graph, of which is uh, one of these the lines. If you have yet another temperature, then this value right uh, that you apply to the one over x graph will change. So it will lead to a new one over x graph and a new one and a new one and so forth. So technically, right, on this CV diagram, you could draw infinite uh, thermo, sorry, isotherms. And the isotherms, right, tells you all the combination of P and V that will give you that particular uh, temperature. So you can have P uh, of this value and V of this value uh, and so on, right? All these points, right, multiply together, give you the same temperature. Whereas, right, they are different from yet another temperature. Okay. Then, if you see that your gas, right, goes from one imaginary isotherm to yet another imaginary isotherm, right, you could tell that there is a change in temperature. Okay. Um, in simple terms, try you see any horizontal line such as uh, C to D or state C to state D, this implies right temperature increase. Yeah, and any vertical line right also can show uh, something about the process. So, for example, B to C, you can see right here part uh, temperature must have increased as well. Of because right, the points B and C and D lie on different isotherms. And these isotherms are um, like outward spreading ones in the uh, top right hand side direction. Pass right, any time that you move that uh, straight up or straight to the right or straight to the left, right, directly vertically or directly horizontally, right, you could tell they must have jump isotherm. Okay. If right, they go in a curved shape, you could also tell uh, by logic, okay, in some cases. So far, so good. So we use isotherms, right, to supplement the fact that, uh, supplement the deficiency of the PV diagram, which is both at key, or to understand the system, right, uh, better. So with that, right, the four key processes, right, are namely, first one, isobaric. Oops. Isobaric, right, bar means what? Bar means pressure. Yeah, you see some places with the pressure is given by how many bars, okay? Just that's the whole uh, imperial unit. Iso means same. Or in chemistry, right, you learn isotopes. So a process, right, that uh, occurs at a same pressure is iso uh, bearing. TV diagram is not difficult to understand. I think, right, the right hand side, this uh, experimental setup diagram right, is very useful. Because when I was a student, when I learned this, right, uh, in a zombie manner when I just uh, know how to calculate. I don't know what it means, okay? So how to visualize it, how that uh, this thing is actually done right in real life. So this diagram is very, very useful. So you see how we can um, achieve an isobaric process, for example. This is just an example. It's not, a, uh, it's not saying all isobaric processes look like this, but it's one case. We know, right, that atmospheric pressure is pretty much constant uh, where we are. So you let the gas try expand against atmospheric pressure, okay, and there will be a isobaric expansion. 
you have hot water here, uh, and you put this gas cylinder right inside. So the gas right will expand, and you will push out against a piston. This piston right, uh, we, we imagine uh, a fixed weight, okay? So it contrib contributes some uh, pressure as well. And then externally right, there's also uh, atmospheric pressure. So both of these combined together right, will be what the gas is pushing against. And these two are fixed. So the gas is always pushing outwards, right, with the same pressure. So this is an isobaric process. Yeah, the volume can change, but we have a way, right, to regulate the pressure such that it doesn't. Next process is called isochoric or iso uh, volumetric. Uh, as the name suggests, this one is straightforward place at the same volume. Same volume is very easy. You just keep the container locked up. Okay, don't let it change uh, in volume. Or you have a, you may have a piston. You may apply a lock mechanism to prevent the piston from moving. Uh, so and then uh, you either uh, heat it up or you uh, remove. Okay, why did I say that? Uh, like as a matter of fact, because right. Iso volumetric, uh, the work done it will be easy. just how we said compression positive work, expansion will be negative work, no change in volume, zero work. So, for this process, right, the most straightforward thing that you can tell, right, is how W is zero. For right, if you want to change its internal energy, you could only heat it up or cool it. Yeah. This is the only agent. Uh, next up, we have a isothermal uh, process. Isothermal process, right, is one whereby you manage to let the gas do whatever you want, compression or expansion, but you keep it right at a fixed temperature. Okay, how can we do that? It's right, uh, you must have a particular reservoir. Okay, oh, this reservoir right is huge. Uh, when in terms of Internal energy, right? Its internal energy content is large, so uh, and it's stable. So when you put something in it, right, uh, and you allow that thing, right, to continuously come to thermal equilibrium with the reservoir, then, right, that object, uh, the system's uh, temperature, right, will not change. But as you uh, have figured out, right, uh, by the way how we explain heat transfer, right, see, heat transfer is a process, right, that is uh, that takes place right by molecules jiggling or uh, and uh, nudging each other right. The more energetic one nudge the less energetic one. This process is not a fast one. Okay, it's a slow process. It needs to take time. So, uh, isothermal process right involve right uh, a lot of this jiggling to just like this nudging right to take place for the temperature to. Uh, come to equilibrium again, come to equilibrium again, come to equilibrium again, so that the temperature never change. Keep on staying at the same, uh, same value. So this implies, right, that this process is uh, actually slow in nature. Yeah, because heat has changed, right, fixedly. The moment, right, you try to uh, Speed things up. You try to uh, do uh, fast work. You cannot really. You cause the temperature to jump because the moment right you compress a gas piston. Uh, let's say you do it very fast. You compress it. Just now our analysis right of this thing. If you do a fast compression right, the temperature will increase. Yeah. So how can you allow the temperature not to increase right? Is to let the reservoir right, soak up your extra. Uh, Ke, yeah, so that your average Ke always ever. Um, finally, right, there's one more 
process, right? We call it a diabetic. A diabetic process, right? The characteristic of I forgot to mention uh, the first law equation for hydrothermal. What's characteristic of this equation, right? Is that delta u is always zero. Okay, because you stay at the same temperature, and you recall, right? Internal energy equals to three over two nRT. So if this is constant, this is constant as well. Or if u is constant, then delta u is zero. Then no change, ma. Yeah. So this equation, right? You always look for this. Then, um, if you want to see what will happen to what, what, if your question is right, what is the heat supplied to the system? Then you figure not by heat supply directly. By, by looking at the graph, is it an extension or is it a compression? So in this case, right, this is the extension. So this means right that W will be less than zero. Also, W is a negative quantity. Therefore, if your delta U right is zero and yet W is negative, this means right that the Q is positive. This is how we deduce right what is happening. We always start from where the clue is and work towards right the unknown. See me in the uh, a diabetic, you see this graph. A diabetic means right no exchange of energy with surrounding. Yeah, no heat flow. That's right, the only way that you can change internal energy. Uh, to doing work and look at the uh, way right volume change in this case right this is a compression compression right means this is a positive work so uh, q is zero w is positive this means right for this particular case this one is a positive quantity and this means right internal energy increase and this means temperature increase. Yeah. So a diabetic process, right, is also a curve. But this curve, right, is steeper than isotherms. Or more correctly said, right, is two isotherms is connecting. Uh, why so? Because right, it must jump temperature. Oh, temperature increase must. So you will have jumped from a lower isotherm to a higher term. That's why right, it must be steeper. If it's like uh, curve in the same gradual manner, right? Then it wouldn't it will jump right, it must leave one isotherm and make its way to uh, another one. Yeah. Let me pause a while. Uh, any on this the four processes? Okay, if not, right? Um, here, there's a table for you to refer to. Oh, but actually, right, we don't need a table to refer. Like, this is not, no shortcut, okay? Because it is very easy, right, to uh, reduce right, the missing quantity that you want, or uh, whether it is heat, uh, delta U, or W, through the graph. And through the clues, right, given in the question, or they tell you this of expansion or compression, then you know something already. Uh, then you can work from where the clues are obvious to the unknown. Okay? Always the same. In fact, right, I will always think that uh, in this kind of first law question, oh, the nature right, is the same as so, so cool. Okay? The nine box or four box you know, kind of fill in the number kind of question, right? Same. Because uh, you are given some clues and you're supposed to figure out others. 
based on the your work long the next one this one imply what that one imply what uh, then finally right you know the most difficult one Lastly, right, we'll talk about the, uh, this idea of circuit cyclic processors. So if you have a gas system, right, uh, you could be doing a series of steps, okay, to it, such that, right, uh, it goes back to the same point as it started, okay, that is by a cyclic process, okay, it goes back to original state. Um, and we will appreciate right, circuit processes a lot more only when we understand the uh, application. But for now, right, let's just entertain it as a theoretical idea. Yeah. Suppose right, I have this um, circuit process, one, two, three, four, okay, in this way. So let's see right, uh, what is the work done, the, the, the various quantity, how does it change right, uh, in throughout one, one whole cycle. So let's look at one to three first, okay, in terms of work done. In terms of work done, right, one to three, right, actually gives rise to this purple colored area. Of, and this is an expansion. Okay, one to two is expansion. Two to three, nothing. Uh, oh. But overall, right, one to three, right, gives rise to a uh, work done by gas. Work done by gas, right, uh, also means this is a, uh, the work done on gas, right, is actually less than zero. In our first law, right, whenever we write delta mu equals to Q plus W, right, in the definition, we already say this is the work done on the system. Oh, so actually, right, this is the default always on one. So if, right, the gas is doing like the opposite of someone doing work on it. So if you say the gas, did a positive work. It means right relative to the external agent, the gas, the gas right, the work done on the gas right is actually negative. Uh, more simply, right, just look at expansion or compression to tell. Okay. Then right, you look at uh, uh, process three to one. Three to one also got a uh, work uh, which is the area under the graph, and this is a uh, for example. On gas. So this one uh, is a positive quantity. But we can tell quite simply, right, that the uh, second case, right, the area is smaller than the first case. So throughout one whole cycle here, right, this network, okay, is actually, right, less than zero. So it means, right, throughout this process, the gas is actually doing work. So we are, uh, if you want to understand right, what's the uh, possible application right, of this, is, is there any way right, that we can like, stimulate a gas system such that right, it actually produce mechanical work? Mechanical work means what? It actually move things. You know? move things, carry load, spread onto something, right? move uh, parts of the machine, something like that. Also, if we stimulate the state properties of the gas in this way, and the gas can uh, move things, right? Then we have an application already. Yeah. Uh, more generally, right, uh, using the logic that we uh, apply above, can we come up with a trend? Okay. Uh, because we want to always try right, see whether is it uh, uh, more work, uh, expansion, or more pressure. So you can generalize it to uh, this pattern. Whereby, right, if you have a clockwise uh, cycle, cyclic process, right. Then the conclusion is the network will be less than zero. Oh, because right, this part will be the compression. This part will be the expansion. And the expansion right uh, happens on top of the compression in terms of the value of pressure. So there will be more work done in the expansion by the gas. Yeah. So network will be uh, less than zero. And vice versa. So here, right, is a uh, compression. Here's an expansion. Okay. So this is a quick way to tell and check the sign. 
of uh, exam right uh, population question always right pay attention to phrasing of if they ask I work by guess or on guess. Uh, lastly, this is totally uh, not in syllabus because I um I feel that this understanding the cycle, understanding uh the uh I do guess all these things that you may think. So why why do we learn this of uh, useless things? Uh, is that used in the real life? And of course that is right. Uh, um, understanding of thermodynamics is what that sparked off the industrial revolution. The industrial revolution, right, is it just like what that stuck off, right, the recent change in our life, right? There are a few things. Number one, right, is uh, the internet. Or the internet, right, revolutionized everything. Whether you talk about smartphone or, or talk about uh, um, whatever that comes after that, right, that's exciting. It's all built on the basis uh, that there is internet. Before internet and after we have internet, right, things radically different, yeah? It's just like right back then, right in the 1700s, with steam engine and without steam engine, right things are radically different. Yeah, so steam engine is one of the of uh, um separate process because right um this is, is of course a lot more complicated. There is right uh ways that you can um heat the gas up and make it do work. I, I, I forgot to mention something. It's getting higher. I, uh, back to this diagram, I forgot to mention that uh, if you start from one and go back to one, right, in a cyclic process, delta is always zero. Okay? So for this process, right, you can actually deduce since delta u equals to q plus w, right, and if the work is negative, and this is zero because we go one full cycle. And this is positive, yeah. So using that, right, uh, steam engine is you put heat in, okay. How you put heat in? You uh, burn the coal. You burn the coal uh, uh, to, to, to heat up the water, create the steam, okay. Uh, cause the steam, right, to uh, expand, contract, expand, contract go through a series of these kind of uh, processes, okay? Then, right, what does steam do, right? Because it's connected to the piston, so the piston will start to 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 oh, then you can use it to power, uh, uh, use it to power machines, yeah? Uh, then the reverse, right, is uh, if you have a motor, or uh, you use a motor, right, you provide electricity, you run the motor, the motor right run, do work, do work, do work, do work, and extract out heat from the system. Okay. Then you have a refrigerator. Yeah. Yeah, and it's um, thermal physics at the plant. Any questions? Oh, I missed out a few diagrams, uh, but then they are not so important. Uh, we can just go through them quickly. Hot versus cup, both 100 degrees C. Which one more internet? Tell me. Do I need to call someone to answer? Let me see who is here. Okay, the first, my personally trained 
Kudan. Uh, maybe you can recall what is meant by internal energy of a system. I think the the pot has more internal energy. Okay, and why is that so? Because uh, there's more mass. Okay. So what? Uh, so there's like more molecules. Okay, more mass, more molecule, and so? Uh, the molecules vibrate, so have more internal energy. Uh, not exactly. You must ask, right, what is the definition of internal energy? Do you remember? Uh, not really. Yes, sir. Some of? Uh, kinetic energy and potential energy. Yeah. So, how do we understand it here? Comparing the molecules right in the coffee, hot coffee in the pot, and the molecules in the hot coffee in the cup, both 100 degrees C. What is the same for uh, them? I give you a clue. Have same. You feel in the last uh, last term. Size. No. Ah, same size. Ah. <laughs> no, you must relate to internal energy, right? Uh, uh, same potential energy. Okay, and. And we are actually talking about the average. Because, right, you see, potential energy, why do we say that it's the same? Oh, because same state. Yeah. Uh, I didn't mention this just now during the entire thing, right? But what gives rise to a difference in potential energy for gas? I do guess it's straightforward, it's zero. Non I do gas systems, right? For example, a cup of water uh, or a block of ice or a uh, uh, the, the steam that escaped out from the uh, boiling water. Whenever right, you have a change in state, of gas, oh, sorry, uh, should be the other way down. So we have solid right to gas, sorry to liquid to gas right. The P right will increase. Okay, so if it's same state, right, they will have around the same average PE and same temperature, so they will have the average KE. So if the molecules have same average KE and same average PE, right, now you want, you want to talk about the whole system, internal energy, you are trying to sum up all of them, right, then whoever has more um, molecules, right, will win. It's just like saying like, oh, let's say Singapore and uh, USA, suppose we have the same GDP per capita. But right, USA got uh, 50 times our population. Yeah, So their overall GDP is bigger. That's the uh, analogy. Okay. For this graph, right, um, briefly mentioned temperature against time when you are up, um, key try to, to change the state of the particular substance, right, you go from solid to all the way to gas. You got to realize, right, that um, oh yeah, 
which is time. Time right times power, assume it's a fixed power, okay? Uh, because you are using a heater, right? And let's say this heater, this rice uh, has a fixed power to it. Then right, time times power gives rise to heat supply. Yeah. One thing to take note here, right? This graph, right? This portion oh, definitely will be. So this is the latent heat of vaporization. Yeah. And this part is the uh, fusion. For most things, right, the vaporization right, is always greater than L fusion. Okay? Because, right, during the vaporization, the temperature actually didn't change. When you are giving energy to the uh, substance, right, average Ke don't change, right? Average Ke stays put. It's the average PE that increase. Or is the entire PE account that increase. And what's happening? Or because right, the energy that you put in right is trying to change the state, going from a to a liquid, liquid to a gas. And it is harder, right? Uh, going from here to here. Here to here is slightly easier by comparison. Okay. So this part, right, the boiling part, right, will be longer compared to here. So it's actually easier to melt, right, the same amount of substance compared to boil the same amount of substance, the amount of energy uh, needed, okay? Last part, right, the continuous flow, I don't want to talk about it. This one, right, you can print, okay, too dry. And it's like a disconnected item, right, in the whole scheme of things. Oh, Mr. Correct. Yeah. Can you explain the cyclic processes again? Why is the work done, like, negative for the first one? Yeah, okay. Because, right, um, in, let's say, in this uh, rectangular cyclic process, uh, the area under the one to three, right, portion is a larger negative work. Whereas the area under the three to one is a smaller positive work. So when you add up, okay, the network right will be a still a negative number. Does this make sense to you? Oh, okay, so you can generalize this, right? Yeah, you generalize it, right? Uh, simply not, you don't even need the, the, the shape, right, of the cycle to be a rectangle or square or predictable shape. It can simply be, right, any clockwise cycle or it will give rise to a uh, network which is negative. Now, uh, anti-clockwise cycle, network will be positive. Okay, thank you. Any other portion, right, that I didn't explain clear enough, you uh, need me to say again. Wait, sorry, could you repeat that again? Because I still don't understand the, what you mean by because it's uh, like the 3 to 1 is on top or something. Then the network done is more or less than zero. Yeah, yeah, can. So the building block, right, to understand this is uh, work is equal to area under the graph. This one, you, you get it? Yeah. Then, right, the next building block, right, is all uh, extension of means, right, is a negative work. Expen uh, compression, right, of and expression means what? Right, 